hi, welcome. Just really quickly, just so we can kind of cover our baselines again. So we are parenting in the digital age. We're going to be doing this um, uh, conversation and an overview about some of the techniques that you can use um, to address some of the issues that are happening with your, your kids and opportunities that, that you have to connect with them when they are online. One of the first things I'm going to recommend that you consider reflecting on is thinking about your own habits. Um, what are the ways in which you are building and you're modeling the habits for, for your child? Um, and what is it that you do every day that can uh, potentially help to support your child in building some of those habits? I'm going to give you two very quick examples and we can kind of move from this. Um, so I'm a parent of a seven-year-old. And one of the things that my child often sees is how often I'm in front of my phone to answer really basic things like text messages. Um, most recently, she says, do you always have to be in front of your phone? And it was a very sort of clear kind of reflection for me because I wasn't processing kind of when I'm in front of her what I was doing. So part of the buildup for our habits is then to be explicit about when her father's on the phone when I'm on the phone and what the reasons um, I'm doing besides that. And it's also a really great time for me to say, if I don't actually have to be in front of the device, in front of my child, what else can I actually be doing in that place? So these are kind of just subtle things that your child or you might be inadvertently like showcasing, maybe um, checking your phone during dinner time. These are all subtle things that you can shift to model something entirely different based on what your, your kids need. Um, let's kind of give some background into like what's actually happening here. And at Common Sense, we do quite a number of, um, we come up with research and we, we have a research uh, department that really helps us to understand what exactly is taking place. And I'm going to give you a quick snippet. We came up with this um, a census report. We do this every year and we are going to give you kind of a snapshot on what our kids are on and what they're doing when they're online. Um, so we know that since the pandemic, our Kids are using quite a bit of screens um, and the, their time has actually gone up. Um, and for most of our kids, and again, this is primarily for tweens or, or um, teens upward um, in their age group, we've noticed that there's an upward, a continuous upward trend of, of kids being online. Um, but you'll notice here that on average, um, tweens and teens are averaging about eight hours and 39 minutes um, a day on entertainment or on their devices. So that went up, obviously we know that since the pandemic, but you will also know that it's gone way up since 2015 when we started this process. And I just wanna let you know what that, that looks like, right? That regardless that our kids are spending a lot of time online. And the next part of our research is we ask our kids, and again, this is a 13 to 18 year old um, kids, we ask them, what are the, some of the platforms that they couldn't live without? And what we're noticing and what I wanna kinda of highlight is two things for you. One is that YouTube as a form of passive entertainment and connection continues to be the primary platform that kids want at this particular age group um, want to connect with, right? So we know that that's, uh, that's a medium of passive consumption, meaning our kids are just often just viewing, clicking, viewing, clicking, viewing. You'll also notice that at 13%, um, TikTok, another platform we talked about yesterday, um, is another platform where kids are actually then engaging so um, with it, which is like then creating videos or manipulating videos or viewing videos, so being a part of that platform. And one thing I want to point your attention to in both of these sort of research, um, these uh, uh, highlights that I kind of shared for these findings is uh, to the extent to which kids are passively viewing content, how much time that they're viewing, and what they're maybe doing to recreate or repurpose um, on these spaces. And that can give you a snapshot of like how to then start having conversations early on about uh, with your kids about what they should and shouldn't maybe be doing online. It's a really, really great way uh, for us to connect. Again, I'm going to give you a personal example. We have a dear friend that um, noticed that her child was using uh, quite a bit of, uh, or wanting to be on TikTok, or wanting to be on YouTube. And early age, again, this is a third grade child. And uh, mom at the time decided that one of the best ways in which she wanted to engage uh, her child is by asking her child um, to draw something that she looked at when she was viewing a particular YouTube cartoon. And so they would pause her video maybe at some point in, in the um, viewing to draw out or sketch what she actually was seeing, what she interpreted that message as being. And this is a really great way to start to diversify the content to start to look at uh, media much more broadly than 
um, how much time is being spent and what they're actually doing with that time. All right, enough of that lecturing. Let's kind of get into specifics. Let's get into like why these things can be problematic. Um, and I think what, what's really important to kind of note as you think about your parenting skills is um, what are the pain points for your child at this point? And there's three that we've kind of outlined in common sense that you should be familiar with. Um, early on, when the child first is introduced to a device, um, the elementary level, you know, until they get to about fifth grade, there's quite a bit of conversations between parent and child about uh, media consumption being very unbalanced. And what that means is parents often have conversations with their child about how much time that they're spending online, as opposed to what whether or not that, that uh, time online is actually quality based. So what I would encourage you to do as a second kind of step um, this afternoon is to ask yourself, are you the parent that constantly is talking about um, getting off their device without actually having much more critical thinking? I mean, um, much more intentional conversations about what that child is actually doing, what your child is doing in, in front of that device. Um, secondly is, are you um, building in time where that child is balancing their time online with other things? You know, maybe they're, are they going to the park before or after? Are they reading books from the San Francisco Public Library? What exactly is that? Um, how are they diversifying those times in order to create a much more balanced human being? If you find that you're also using it as a temporary babysitter that sometimes I do. Um, acknowledge when those times are and be more explicit about what you want your child to be doing when they're viewing some stuff instead of just giving them a device. The second thing that you'll notice and things that um, we are hearing is that as kids get a little older, right around middle school, um, there's quite a bit of what they refer to as the grind, meaning that they're, the production of and the curating of their content becomes very real to them. So as a child sort of engages in um, social media and engages in, in um, socialization at this point, meaning being friends with others online, they really are spending a lot of time using filters, uh, curating what they wanna share in on these platforms. So what's really important to note is that if you have a child that's in middle school, um, one of the things that you wanna be aware of is how much time your child is actually spending on any given device to do a specific thing. So if Kate and I, if Kate's my child and Kate is spending a lot of time like uh, redoing her hair, creating a particular filter to be connected with her friends in a particular way, we want to kind of interrupt those com or the, that process um, by asking uh, Kate, Kate, what's, what else is going on? What else can we potentially do? Right? We want to make sure that we interrupt the curation and the fatigue associated with the child being on any uh, given device for long periods of time. All right, I'm going to make sure that you kind of take um, take a step back and kind of know what you want to um, get out of sort of the pain point. You know? So what I would love for you to do is really reflect on, you know, how you parent as a um, your child when it comes to some of these pain points before we get into the final one. Um, is it a constant harassment? Is it, is it an actual uh, intimate conversation you're having about the content that they're viewing? Are you sharing your own uh, viewing and your own sort of ways in which you're engaging with media? Um, these questions are really key and to reflect on um, because the third thing I think is probably key in all of this. We notice that as our kids develop kind of a, a social identity in, di in these digital spaces, there's a lot of room for misinterpretation, miscommunication. When families often uh, share with me kind of their biggest concerns is um, they often share that they don't want their child to be bullied online or they don't want to participate, um, have their child participate in any type of digital drama. And what I would often say to them is um, I ask them, how often do you practice um, resolving dilemmas online for your child? So here's sort of the big takeaway in all this. Um, we see an upward trend of kids miscommunicating online and taking um, miscommunication to a, a heightened level. And I'll give you a really quick example. I might say to Sabrina or Kelly or Jose, if you're on the line, um, something, I was sharing a particular image and I made fun of a particular part of that image. Now, Jose, Kelly, Sabrina might actually interpret that message wrong and respond to that Instagram message or that message very differently, which then causes a very a big tension, right? That rather than actually ask for clarification, a skill that my child may or may not develop, um, they react to something as we often do. Um, so one of the things that we want to consider in this pain point for you all is we address this pain point is to uh, ask yourself how often 
am I communicating with my child about how to resolve something online? These are kind of really cre key and critical kind of pieces. So let me just quickly summarize this. Number one is thinking beyond like how much time your child is spending and asking um, to think about uh, the quality of the content that they are engaged with. Two is interrupting when your child is uh, producing videos or engaging in content um, more explicitly, interrupting that process and asking them to think critically about what it is that they post and how often they feel uh, connected to what it is that they're sharing. And finally, to actively practice um, communication skills in online spaces. Um, so when they are confronted with dilemmas online, they can really um, use some of your support in that process. All right, so let's kind of go back to the beginning here, right? The first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is um, think about a habit you wanna create for your child this week. Um, maybe it's putting your phone away, maybe it's uh, showing ways in which they, they can navigate conflict. Maybe it's about communicating over an email. It depends on where you're at, but uh, start with one habit that you want to try to build in your family and model for your child. Communicate that. Um, in my own household, it's about putting devices away. So what I'm doing this week is teaching my child what it is to actually put a device away and what I'm doing to close up for the next day. So I've sort of showed her like how I journal or how I take care of my to-do list and what that looks like online. And we sort of have this process of doing that online. It's a really subtle habit, but this is something that I use in online spaces to model for her what I expect from her when she moves from one space to another. <clears throat> Think about yours. All right, let me give you some tips now so you understand kind of the, the where you can kind of turn to for that. All right, so we have, if you are interested and you're like, Jamie, I have no idea what these tools even mean. What do I do with all this information? Like, where do I start? I don't know what this thing called the TikTok is, whatever this thing is. I'm gonna provide you with a one really great resource here. Uh, Common Sense offers free resources for you. So as a parent, you can turn to uh, our ultimate guides and it gives you a, a broad overview, a broad stroke of what each of these platforms do. Again, I gave a session yesterday on some social media basics. I'm gonna provide you with a way in which you can kind of look at a platform and learn a little bit more about. Let me share this quick video so you all can kind of see what this is. You may not know about the popular social image sharing platform, Instagram. Number one, according to the terms of service, kids should be 13 years old before signing up. Unfortunately, Instagram has no age verification process, so lots of kids younger than that are using it. Number two, some users have multiple accounts that are completely separate from each other. Fake Instagram accounts are public facing and highly curated and project an ideal online persona that's hard to achieve in reality. Number three, depending on whom you follow or what you search for, you can find lots of mature content on Instagram. Whether it's cyberbullying or oversharing, comments on posts can be downright vicious, especially if an account is public. Number four, Instagram accounts are public by default, so the first setting to change is the privacy setting. With a private account, only people you approve can see what you post. Number five, using Instagram might affect a teen's body image and sense of self. The pressure to look perfect or to get the most likes and followers means some teens will be comparing themselves to others. And number six, Instagram is also a place kids can be creative, posting art, poetry, and videos that showcase their talents. So when used purposefully and in balance with other activities, the app can leave kids feeling connected and positive. For more tips, visit us at commonsense.org. So you can see right away, we'll, we can provide you with some basic tips. Again, if your um, child is on roadblocks or if um, they're on Minecraft, we have an ultimate guide that includes videos, very basic videos that you can then turn to. Um, some really interesting um, resources for you as a home. All right, let me kind of close with this, just so you all, we can take some questions and kind of think about, you know, like what are things happening in your own life? If I'm in your position today, one of the ways in which we can just start is by the conversations that you actually have with your child about the, their own digital presence. And I'm going to give you three conversation stars that can actually help you to develop a much more um, engaging kind of way to talk to your child about tech use. And if you, if you use appropriately, if you use to connect with your child, if you use to affirm your child's well-being, which I think most of you do, um, it could really help you to develop a really strong relationship with your child about what it is that they're doing online. So the first thing that you may want to kind of ask yourself is, 
um, asking your child, uh, suspending your judgments about something your child might be doing online, and instead asking them what they did online that made them feel a certain way, that triggered something for them. Um, this could look something like this, right? Jose, I noticed that you're eating some peanuts right now. They look really good, or you're noticing a snack. Um, what did you do online today that actually made you hungry for peanuts today? Is there anything that you saw online that made you feel a particular way? So what I'm doing in this first conversation is I'm actually being inquisitive and I'm being extremely thoughtful about what I, how I want to connect my child's overall well-being to an experience that they actually had online. See if you can put those two together in the conversations that you have. Sort of try to remove, um, remove yourself from how much time that they're spending and instead sort of start to delve into what they viewed how often they viewed what what triggered something for them when they were doing a particular act online. It's a really great way for your child to start to kind of open up to you when they feel um, pressures, right? This is a great kind of connection to them. The second thing that that might be really helpful is oftentimes, and more, more likely than not, as your kids get a little older, they will be confronted. They will see things that might be inappropriate, might not be developmentally um, uh, in alignment with where, what you are as a parent or what your values are as a family. Um, but what we want to try to do is we want to try to ask our kids, how are they actually solving some of those dilemmas, those arguments, those tensions that they might have? So a great question to start with is um, anytime your child has seen something or they share something to you, instead of providing the answer to something or asking them logistical questions or detailed questions related to that, you may want to ask them how they process that particular experience online. So a prompt like, how did you actually solve that dilemma with your friend? Uh, I had a really great uh, parent friend that's recently noticed that her kids are having a hard time talking about slime. And they were using uh, one of a platform called Roadblocks in order to connect about an argument that they had at school. So the parent, you know, again, the advice was about how they actually resolve some of these issues. And the parent really wanted to know um, what was the pain point, but more importantly, how they were actually trying to resolve it. And then it was only when the child said, well, actually, we had an conversation when we were playing roadblocks, mom, where the parents said, well, maybe that's not the best way to resolve an issue when you're playing an independent game. Instead, you may want to consider doing some other things, right? These are kind of the things that we want to help with our kids um, as they are confronted with these experiences. And then finally, I cannot stress this enough, um, build this in your day like get off the call right now. Think about what your child did really well today, both online and in person, and say that to them. Our kids with mental health being a huge kind of issue, particular our, with our middle and high school kids, they need to know, they need to be affirmed when they're doing something really well online. It could be as simple as, I really appreciated you got off without me asking you, or I really admired the fact that you set a timer when you um, join that video game, whatever the thing is, pick one thing that you will say to your child today that you really appreciated about them. And if you're like, Jamie, there's nothing. My child is the worst when he, when he or she turns into when they grab their device. Um, maybe you can just compliment the way they're holding the device, right? Like really try to start somewhere and see if you can kind of build from that. The point here is that we want to try to build in and re reinforce those positive um, insights or those positive experiences that your child has, because your child will be listening to that experience. All good? All right, I'm gonna give you some last kind of resources for you. And, and this is a really great resource if you're interested in your child's overall social and mental well-being online. Um, what we have at Common Sense, and you'll notice in each of the slides, is we've incorporated um, social and emotional skills to then build into daily conversations uh, at home. And what we've done is we've uh, teamed up with an organization named Castle. And what they've outlined is these five core skills that kids need to know about their presence. And we essentially said, hey, if a child needs to be self-aware, how can that child be self-aware when they're in online spaces? So for you as a parent, we've sort of done that really difficult work of providing you some very basic conversation starters that means like if you're at the dinner table, if you're driving in a car, instead of actually, um, you know, going into your particular spaces, you might want to have com these broader conversations about something. I'm going to give you one example, just so you are aware um, in, um, in retrospect, right, or in, in connection to something. So if I'm a parent of a middle school child, I might have um, conversations with them about what makes really good digital habits. 
And the conversations that I want to have is making sure that a child is aware of their own habits when they're in front of a device. So I might say to Kate, if she's my child, like, um, Kate, what does it actually mean to you to actually have a regular sort of um, habit? What do you do every day before or after you wake up? What are you actually doing in that, that space? And, and what Kate might respond are conversations that we can then help to kind of uh, to curate or connect and to support during that during that time during those like initial conversations right again this is a basic um, conversation around self management and how to manage their own time but if you don't build in these conversations as you know um, then the child might not actually be introduced to them in digital spaces you can't just simply say to the child do your bed we want to kind of get to that get them to kind of understand what what the process is um, to build these habits and also to have balance in their life. So uh, without being said, these are kind of the what they what it looks like. I encourage you to kind of click on them. We again, we outlined all five of these um, into basic conversation starters you can have as a family. All right, enough of me talking. Let's practice. Jamie, what the heck can I do tomorrow to make sure that I'm parenting in a way that affirms some of the points that you've made just uh, for the last 20 or so minutes? Um, here's what I would do if I were in your position. Number one is uh, take inventory, review what it is that's happening in your family, um, and reset the expectation if you if it, it if it doesn't agree to the values that you've set forth. I see many parents that say, you know, my it's over with my kid. They don't listen to anything I do, and I can't control that. Well, today I'm giving you the power to kind of make it happen, and um, but set the expectation. We want to make sure that that's really clear and review what it is that your child is actually doing online. If they're playing roadblocks or too much, um, if they are uh, constantly asking for the device and they don't have any self-control, we want to make sure that we res reset what it is that we're doing when we're in front of the device and be clear about the, the expectations moving forward. Um, practice with your kid. The second thing is pick a, an experience that they might have online, something that's tricky Maybe something that they view that it makes the whole family feel uncomfortable. Practice how to get through that. And you know, like my seven-year-old, I might say, so you just saw an ad that said all children should die. And now you're now repeating that. Let's practice again, reviewing that ad one more time. And tell me what we can do when you feel uncomfortable in that moment. Instead of singing that, what else can we do? And while it makes me feel really uncomfortable knowing that my child is now repeating an ad that... Uh, that discusses that i we're going to get past that and then we can process that as a family but we in that moment we have to figure out how to navigate those situations and practice enable have our child sort of practice what they're going to do when they're in these particular spaces um, and then the final thing that i might have is if you have a network uh, for your family and of other parents let's say you have uh, a really great friends or your child's friends or parents uh, have a conversation with them the next time you're picking up your child, you're connecting with them. Ask them what they are doing to address some of these norms and see if you can start actually having a collective about what you expect your child and your kids to be doing collectively online. Because you, you might not know that, you know, your child might be sort of developing long lasting relationships with, um, with um, their peers. And we want to kind of set the expectation, maybe build sort of a, a, a little village that you can kind of help to support your child in that process. And all right, I've talked to your ear off. Thank you so much for the time. Um, thank you so much for being here, Jamie. I really appreciate, appreciate you, Kate. It. Thank you all so much for being here. Are you all? Thanks, Kate.